Welcome to Pop Turnative, where we dive into topical discussions from the worlds of pop culture, social media, and sports. Here is your host, Peter Romoliotis, a.k.a. PD Beats. Hello and welcome to the Pop Turnative Podcast. This is the podcast where we have digital discussions, the worlds of pop culture, social media, sports, music, everything really. As always, I'm your host, Peter Miliotis. On Twitter goes PD Beats. I am really excited to be to be joined by the founder of the Vans Warp Tour. We're with Kevin Lyman. Kevin, welcome to Pop Turnative. Uh, thanks for having me on. Hope you're well. I hope you're well as well. Um, so many, so many things to talk about. So many questions, but I'm sure you're asked this a lot in interviews. When did the idea for this hybrid music festival, skateboard festival, come to be? How did you get into it all? It was really about 19. It was 1995. I actually in the. It was a. I was doing an event called Board Aid. It was a charity event where we would have snowboarding and music and skateboarding and. Um, I had just heard about the X Games starting and this culture that we'd been living in Southern California where I would hire the Red Hot Chili Peppers to be on top of a skate ramp and, I, and just a bunch of other things. I said, you know what, this is all going to come around. Yeah. Uh, we should be doing it ourselves before we're working for someone else. And I'd already been working in the music business about 12, 13 years and running about 320 shows a year. I was the first stage manager of Lollapalooza in 1991. So I was actually thinking about going off and getting that real job that so many of us are asked that maybe a little more stability with my first daughter on the way. But I thought for one last summer, I would go out and do something with uh, my friends, uh, blending skateboarding and music and see the country with them. Absolutely. And uh, that became the Warp Tour in 1995. Absolutely. And then in 96, fans got involved. Uh, we saw something really happening. Bands like No Effects and Pennywise uh, endorsed the tour. So we kind of got known as this punk rock tour, even though it was a very eclectic music festival from the beginning. No, absolutely. What were, I mean, I'm sure it's a long list, but is there anything you can um, point out that you liked the most about like running and working on the tour? I mean, was it the music? Was it just the networking aspect of things? What made the Vans work Tour memorable for Kevin Lyman? Well, for me, it was, you know, getting to travel the country and build those kind of relationships. I never really toured when I was younger. I worked in the local clubs, yep. I worked in venues around Los Angeles. So actually getting to travel the country, I reversed it where most people travel around the country and then work locally. Um, I went reverse. I got to travel around. I made lifelong friendships, people to this day uh, that I love seeing were part of those early tours. And, uh, you know, watching artists develop watching crew people develop into some of the leaders of the music business now. And some of those brands, early brands that we worked with, you know, the Hurleys and the Volcoms of the world become household names after starting in those parking lots. No, absolutely. You mentioned, you know, um, the punk rock aspect of the Vance Word Tour bands like No Effects, Pennywise. There was at one point a shift in terms of more genres of music being involved with the festival. Um, when, w when did you kind of... Um, like what like talk a little bit about that because you had you know um post hardcore metalcore bands like you know silverstein um august burns red those bands became asking alexandria they became very popular and then they started to become featured on the tour with a more variety what, what why did you think a change like that was needed for the vans work tour well, I think really we were, you know, I, I would you know tend to disagree in some ways because in 1995, that first year we went around. We had No Doubt, which is a ska band. We had Sublime, which was a surf band, kind of a surf reggae band. Had L7, which was coming out of the post-grunge movement. Uh, no Use for Name was punk. Seaweed probably fell into the indie realm. Uh, Civ was, you know, it's, you know it, it was eclectic, but we got known as a punk tour. But early, even in those early years, we had bands like Sugar Ray, Black Eyed Peas, Kid Rock, Limp Biscuit. I mean, they didn't really fall into the punk realm. It was just that we kind of grabbed, you know, those literally those bands like No Effects and Pennywise kind of legitimized it. And we got known as Punk Rock Summer Camp. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was a positive or a negative, but we got known as this punk rock tour. But if you really look at the tour, it's been eclectic from the beginning and remains to this day to, you know, the last few years having artists like BB Rex and G-Eazy coming out of the tour. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. So many bands and so many different artists um, have been discovered through the Vance Warped Tour. For myself, bands like Four Years Strong, um, bands like Broadside, I, I discovered those bands through the Vance Warped Tour. Um, 
I, I, and one other thing that really got me into bands before, you know, the digital age like Spotify is the Vans Warped Tour compilation CDs. Yeah, those, ha- yeah, those CDs were Side One Dummy. Yep. Uh, originally, I was going to put them out on a record label called Dummy, and Side One was going to distribute it. And that's where we merged the, the two labels, like right at the beginning, into Side One Dummy. And uh, those, you know, those $5 comps, I think they might be $5.99 now, uh, but those comps were always a way to expose people to music. Uh, you know, similar, like you said, now you have your Spotify playlists and you could punch up the Warp Tour playlist right now. I, I think it's already loaded up there somewhere on Spotify. And, you know, you could kind of see who's coming out this summer. And, you know, all of a sudden people are starting to explore that. Uh, Warp is not for everyone. It's been, you know, a certain fan loves Warp Tour. Someone that likes uh, maybe is not driven by a certain song. They're just driven by the love of music. And Warp's been that parking lot that you can wander around in, and you'll always walk out with someone. And, you know, a great Canadian band called Bedouin Sound Clash, you know, uh, kind of got discovered. And I put them through Warp Tour and brought them down to the States. And, uh, you know, it's been, a, it's been a fun time, you know, being able to expose people to so much music. And the Kevin Says stage was essentially bands that you had picked, correct? Yeah, Kevin says, I, I tended to used to travel the country and I'd say, yeah, you can go down. I tell people all year, show up and you can play the Warp Tour. And and, and Kevin and they'd all show up in the production office and say, Kevin says you, he, we could play. And no one knew where to put them. And we'd jam them on a stage and we'd make it work. And then that became a legitimate stage, uh, which went on for many years. Because I think that was a really um, cool thing. You know, myself, like I, I was a concert promoter in Montreal and Ottawa. Um, and you know, there were bands like State Champs that we booked in Canada before they... Um, before you know, they signed and played Vance Warped Tour and everything. And what I found very interesting is the the local aspect of it. Kevin was really important. The fact that there was a local stage for every um, local city, um, and bands would really like be able to put on the resume that you know they played the Vance Warped Tour. They got to meet everyone. Did you always um, envision the local aspect of it? Like, I mean, it's it's from Absolutely. some yeah i mean you can't you can't disagree that that's a huge importance you know getting street teams involved local bands to promote it in the city absolutely um i i've always believed that we need to, you need to have local elements to shows uh you know help the local scenes you know some people say that you know maybe say oh you know they, they'll say oh warp tour doesn't help the local bands but you know i know that we booked about 250 of them already for this next summer uh, the final run, we were bringing back that stage, you know, in full effect. And we've been booking them, you know, through some relationships with people like Rever- Reverb Nation. But, but, you know, mostly they're handpicked by me and the people in my office. Um, and they'll be get a chance to play their one warp Tour show this year. Mm-hmm. So you, do, you did mention it, the final run. It was announced by Vans Warp Tour. This is the final Vans Warp Tour. Um, I just wanted to know, I mean, there, there's there's a lot of things that can be said about it. It's such a tour that had such an effect on so many bands, so many fans. Um, it might not be that, you know, um, easy to answer, but what were kind of some of the reasons behind calling it for uh, calling the tour and, and not doing it anymore? Well, some of them, you know, they're definitely, you know, very personal to myself. You know, um, I work a certain way. I'm 100% all in and physically to go out and run a two month tour the way I do um, is getting harder. Yeah. You know, uh, I just turned 57. Uh, people are like, Oh man, you're getting, I go, yeah, well, I didn't start this when I was, you know, I'd already worked 12 years in the music business before I started the warp tour. Um, and some of them are, you know, warp's always been about education, philanthropy and music. Uh, the business has changed. Uh, you know, it's, it's a definitely a changing business. We've been able to navigate it for 25 years. Um, if you base it on, you know, Ticket sales, uh, we, we've been pretty fairly steady for those 24 years. I mean, this year is looking like an amazing year. All you have to do is say you're leaving and then everyone everyone can't make an excuse not to come next year. Uh, but, you know, it's also, you know, it's it's we want to be able to focus a little more as a company. I think we've gone into like brand building, uh, philanthropy. I've got this new FEN movement, the opioid, anti-opioid initiative, the ed- opioid education. Um, and we're doing a lot of other things. And I think we've done everything in the format that we can. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I think we've done a good job at it. And everything has to come to an end. But this might open the door because all these there's a lot of people who say they could do this better or or maybe on your social media, you read that you should retire or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging them. I said 1997, there's going to be some kid in his garage trying to figure out how to kick my ass and put me out of business. You know, uh, no one did. 
So, you know, uh, now's your doors open. So now I bet, you know, every, someone's thinking about how they're going to put out the next warp tour type thing. It just no. won't be a warp tour. Oh, no, ab- absolutely. Um, I remember, you know, um, it was always, you know, the big week when Vans Warped Tour would announce their lineup. And you had, every year you had different ways of doing it. You would announce it, you know, um, day by day. There's sometimes where you just, like, out of nowhere, we'd go on social media, boom, the whole lineup was announced. You'd be like, whoa, that's crazy. Um, take us through kind of the process of every year figuring out some of the bands that would play and some of the headliners. Because I'm sure it had to do with, you know, um, you have to kind of space it out. Bands that played it, you know, in 2016, maybe wouldn't pl- headline it in 2017 because you want to kind of diversify it. Every- but there were some bands that, you know, played um, year after year sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, but I mean, talk a little bit about the process of, of picking the lineups a little bit. Well, I mean, you know, you kind of put it out there, see who's available. You know, everyone submits and then talks. And then there's bands that really, you know, like a band like a Paramore or Day to Remember they were a big part of development. So they would come back for years. They would start out where we just, I knew they had the raw talent Mm -hmm. and then they would come back when people were starting to talk about it. And then they usually came back a third time when they could really help pull fans. And then they would have those fans and, and, you know, they would take a step back to move forward. That's what the whole scene was. You'd have bands that, you know, knew that coming back to warp tour financially. Um, But back then you you used to make money on CDs. So I, you know, understandably now it might be harder to come back and do warp tour because to keep that ticket price where we want to keep it, which is still the most reasonable ticket price for a festival out there and uh, for what we deliver, that you have to take a, a step back to move forward. And those steps back now are making are a little harder to do now because you have to make your money when touring. It's also Europe. You used to go to Europe just in early June and go back at the end of August for some of those festivals. Now there's a summertime. There's a festival every week, multiple festivals in Europe. So, you know, you have to go out there and piece it together. I mean, this year uh, we have special guests in certain markets. You know, uh, we've got some real fun stuff coming up. I think, you know, especially up in Canada, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We've got some surprises, but, you know, having Simple Plan and Sum 41 on the same show, it's pretty epic. No, absolutely. I, I want to talk a little bit about Vance Wurter's little brother, I like to call it, or little sister, Taste the Chaos. Oh, yeah. Because Taste the Chaos was one of my favorite tours, uh, the, uh, one of my favorite, you know, events of the year. And so I've seen so many bands, different bands from that. You know, you can go like from first to last, both for my Valentine, Bring Me the Horizon, so many different bands. Yeah, um, the romance. I mean, I don't know. Were you at one of those crazy shows in Montreal when it was like 24 below zero? And oh, yeah. was getting out there in the parking lot and they're like, you know, We'd roll up and you guys would all be lined up and I'd be free. Like we get, and it was like that tennis stadium or wherever we play. Oh yeah. You, you had, yeah, of course. And you had one uh, year where you had the used and uh, 30 seconds to Mars. And I believe Aiden was on that tour as well. And that was just the talk of the town. Cause Aiden was one of those bands that was, I, I thought could have like, was going to do like more things. Like I was, I, I was like hearing about, that was a band all the time. Like under Oath obviously was a band take back Sunday. Those bands were talked about bands like Aiden, Amber Pacific. I am ghost who I saw at war tour a few times. Like there was a, there was like a niche created from that taste of chaos tour. Yeah. We, you know, we saw that opportunity. And then of course I wasn't smart enough because I'm from California where we wear shorts and t-shirts all summer or all winter time. And then I said, Oh, let's go tour across Canada in the middle of the winter. I think we were there in January and February, uh, but you guys were dying for shows at that point. You were more than happy to come out. And I think we sold out every show pretty much across Canada at that point, but we were driving around on an ice block. Um, I don't think some of the fans knew just how sick everyone was. We, I've never, I've been on tours and we all get summertime colds or the, I mean, we had, you know, the plague, you know, I've never seen sicker people working on a tour, but we got that show up every day. And the bands, you know, pulled it together to do their sets. The crew got the show up every day. But, I mean, just talking to you, my fingertips get cold again because I think I I, had, I, I was permanent, I was frozen for about a month. I'll never forget when we finally got above freezing, we got to Vancouver. And we all, it wasn't even that, it was cold there still. Mm-hmm. But we all laid on the hot asphalt, just like lizards, just trying to soak up any kind of warmth. I mean, at least there's eventually like an indoor venue to go in rather than Vans Warped Tour where in Montreal one year, it just rained nonstop and... Norma Jean was playing and people were doing mudslides down the hill. And I yeah. thought that was probably one of the coolest moments ever. That never stopped you guys in Montreal. You'd rip up the grass, throw the grass, you know, I don't know. So Montreal was always a special show for me. 
I wanted to also ask too about the schedule every day because the one thing that I I was like I did my best and it was a bit stressful the bands worked for Kevin was you had a lot of bands you wanted to see but there were conflicts because you know there's so many bands playing right and yeah. I remember you know protest the hero play at the same time as Greeley Estates one year right so I'm literally like running back and forth to hear each song you know what I mean did you ever get was there any like flack or um criticism about that sometimes where you had you know a big band like because the, the the main stage was never really overlapped you made a good effort at that but you know you had some bands on you know the hurley stages or the skull candy stages that would maybe play at the same time as like a day to remember and it was pretty intense people have to go back and forth yeah i mean you get a little bit you know i definitely got a heart but those kind of people didn't get that's what warp tour was supposed to make you want to see these bands again mm-hmm. and build a community because they're all they were all touring the next six months after Warp Tour. So it was a sampling. You'd have to run, you'd catch out who you could, and then hopefully go see their shows on their own. And uh, I mean, it was, it, it Warp, Warp was for a certain fan. It's not for, every, it wasn't for everyone. Do you think that the comparisons to like Comic-Con, like, because like, Bad's Warp Tour has like a lot of the music, but you know, you go to, there, there's a lot of vendors, there's a lot of like uh, booths, you know, you could get your favorite like uh, band to sign a, a CD, you can get a sticker. A lot of giveaways. Like, I would always say, War Tour was like Christmas, Kevin. Early Christmas, Christmas in July. You'd go and you'd get, like, Epitaph would give out some cool stuff. I got a bag from Epitaph one year. Like, I got, like, a school bag that Epitaph gave me. But, like, yeah. when I go to Comic-Con, I, that would be different. You know, you'd have to buy certain things. But there's a lot of giveaways. Was that important, too, to kind of partner up with some companies, give more value for your buck type thing? Absolutely. I mean, you know, Warp Tour was as much a, a music festival as a lifestyle fair. We wanted you guys to go back in and, and 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 kind of get into the culture, and that included the record labels, include the clothing brands. So you know, giving you guys little tidbits versus charging you for everything. I always wanted you guys to have some stuff to take home, uh, and that was a big part of it. You know, so uh, I'm glad you uh, that Epitaph backpack. Uh, I remember those well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it would be really cool too. You know, where bands would do like special like Skull Candy signings, and you know, the first twenty people that would show up would get like Skull Candy headphones. I mean, they were they were just happy to be there, the opportunity to buy a CD or buy a shirt. Like it was just it was a bonus. It was like gravy on the mashed potatoes. Yeah, it was a. Uh, you know, I'm I'm proud of what we did. It wasn't perfect, but you know, Warp wasn't perfect. But you know, it's all good things. You know, just it's time for us to do something else. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think we, you know, we could do this for a while again, but I have great people that work for me and we want to challenge ourselves and, and do some new things. And, uh, that might be in the philanthropic realm a little more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, it's been a great run and we're going to have a great run this summer. I'm glad we're getting back up to Canada. That's, yep. uh, that's going to be nice to come up into Toronto. I was up there for Canadian Music Week a couple of weeks ago, and it was nice to see a lot of friends who were planning on coming out. Oh, absolutely. And like you said, Simple Plan, um, Sum 41, Silverstein as well. Shane Toll came on the show a couple months ago and said that, you know, um, they uh, they were asked to come back and play Toronto, which they are very excited about. I mean, they that's another band. I remember I heard, like, you know, so many memories from War Tour, you know, like the Circle Pit falling, cutting my knee a little bit during Silverstein. I mean... So many awesome moments. But, Kevin, thank you so much for joining me on Pot Thank you very really much for having me on the show. No, absolutely. Um, plug away. I mean, you mentioned a little bit. Um, where can people kind of find out about what you're doing um, post-Vans Work Tour? Um, uh, where can they kind of uh, check out more information about the final run? Talk a little bit. Plug away. Yeah, it's www.vanswarptour.com. You can get information on dates and, and clicks for tickets. Um, I'm also uh, working on the opioid initiative. Um, it's... Uh, you can check out wearefend.org, you know, check it out, download the app. You can win Warp Tour merchandise, Warp Tour things going on this summer. And we're going to be extending that, extending that program. And I'm looking forward to starting as a professor at the University of Southern California, starting here in the fall. So, yeah, congrats. Are you, te- are you teaching music business? It's going to be a business courses, yes, geared towards the entertainment and music. That is awesome. That, I saw you, you tweeted that on, on social media and, and the people were losing their minds off that <laughs> yeah, overall overall 99 percent of the people were positive and there's one couple of people that says i'll be misery to chill to anyone who wants to learn anything but that's how you learn uh you just move forward and and keep trying to improve in life and uh you know we're going to be doing a lot of stuff as for feeney some of the people have asked us like as you know what's happening with the company the company will be doing a lot of consulting on other festivals uh projects working with brands all the things we've always done 
uh, people don't realize that we do more than the Vans warp Tour. No, for sure. Well, Ken, thank you so much. Good luck um, with your career as a professor. Good luck with all the new initiatives and good luck with the final run of the Vans Warped Tour. All right. Thank you very much. No problem. Well, this has been Popternative. Catch previous episodes of Popternative, youtube.com slash Popternative, and you can subscribe on iTunes and Spotify for the audio versions. Until next time, this is Kevin Lyman and PD Beats signing off. Thank you for tuning in to Popternative. Make sure to check out our past episodes of Popternative on YouTube. Be sure to like Popternative on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been an Autograph Communications production.